Hey, it's Rich, and you're listening to the Mature Me Podcast, weekly content devoted to all things life, leadership, culture, and faith. Thank you for taking some time to tune in. Make sure you subscribe and follow us on all our social channels so you don't miss a thing. Let's listen to today's episode. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Mature Me. My name is Rich Wilkerson, and I'm happy that you're joining us wherever you're at in the world. We're so grateful that we get to come to you. Maybe you're listening to this right now in your car. Maybe you're watching on YouTube. If you are, do us a favor. Like, subscribe, share. Leave us a comment. Tell us where you're tuning in from. Send some questions. We're always looking for feedback, ways to get better to help you. The whole point of this podcast, as we keep saying it, is not to simply grow old, but it's to grow up. I want to get better. And who you're becoming tomorrow is actually more important than who you actually are right now today. You're growing and becoming something. Today, I am super pumped. Are we allowed to say that? Super pumped? I like that. You can say it. Super pumped. Amped. I think that's Isn't there a TV show called Super Pumped? I think that's the the Uber story, I think. Was that the Uber story? Julia, did you see that with Joseph Gordon-Levitt? It's another story with Joseph Gordon-Levitt. We'll get into some time. Great actor, by the way. Um, I'm excited because a new friend of mine, someone that I have been uh, watching from afar for quite a while, someone that I admire, he is a husband, father, and pastor of Legacy in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, It's none other than the lead pastor himself, Pastor Lyle Phillips. How are you, my friend? Bro, I'm so good, and thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Bro, we've been trying to get you to Miami. Let's talk about it now for about a decade. For about a decade. Stop, bro. For about a decade. I had no idea you even knew about Legacy Nashville Church, Let's go. Bro, I know um, my friend Doe. Okay, yes. Doe Jones. Don't say the last name. Just Doe. That's the artist. Doe, that's right. The artist formerly known as Doe Jones, a.k.a. Doe. I think was the first person who told me about you guys. She loves you guys, man. Yeah, we love her. We love She's her. She's something. So anointed, so powerful. We this love That's why she could Del. sing better. Yeah, you know we've really I mean? been like, praying for her. Have you had her, like, you should probably get her through the audition stuff yeah. though, first just to make sure yeah, she's got Yeah, some vocal lessons. Maybe she needs some of that before we let her lead again. Yeah, but yeah, we're, yeah. We're, but I mean, we're, we're loving her into her purpose. she got a good heart. She got a, like, how does, how does somebody have dough sitting there in the church? It's like... We got we to gotta use you. It's like, ah, I know, but I'm just coming to receive. It's like, well, you got to give at some yeah. point, too. Oh, yeah. But that's Nashville, Rich. So we yes. have seven Talk worship that. leaders that were on The Voice. See. In our church. I can't do this. I know bro. that's wild. Yeah, I can't But do we this. have BGVs that were just on The Voice. See, I can't do this, man. Yeah. It's really not fair. Other it, pastors tell me, don't say that in public. But That's crazy. I know. It's wild. Nashville, Tennessee, no place like it, man. No, no place, place like, like it. it. We're man, I'm so happy that you're here today. Thanks for, for coming on. Um, honestly, a big fan of yours and man, love watching all the things that you and your wife are doing, the way that you guys are leading. It's really inspiring for me, and uh, I'm just pumped that we get to have a little conversation. It's funny. Uh, I wore my uh, Nike Alphas today. The Alpha Fly. As I put them on, I'm on your Instagram Seeing that my man is a marathon runner, and um, I kind of wore these as a flex, like yes, sir. only those who know, like real recognizes real. Oh yeah. And now I feel dumb because I'm like, nah. I just found this out. I'm like, Lyle has already ran two marathons with some insane times. No, no, the first one was not an insane. Because I just ran a marathon recently, and it was not. You got to talk about it. I, it, if I'm you're in a therapy vegan, about it, bro, I can't talk a cross about fitter, it. A crossfitter or a marathoner, yep. you have to talk about it every conversation. It's true. The best thing about running a marathon, telling people, yes. I'm preparing for a marathon. That's right. Brother, That's I right. preached about this 14 weeks in a row. It's yes, the only sir. illustration I had. It's the only content I had. Absolutely. Um, no, I ran one, but it wasn't a very good time. But but you actually are like, you're a, you're a marathon runner. No, this is a new thing. So I would consider yeah, tell me myself about like an amateur runner, right? So, yeah. um I, I love running, and the reason for that is because of my father. So he ran five miles a day my whole life. So Really? Yeah. I, that's like some of my earliest memories about my dad was him getting home from work, putting the shoes on, lacing them up, and out for a run. So he put it in me, and so I always wanted to run, and he invited me to run my first marathon in 2021, I okay. think it was. And so I ran one, but I was not really ready for it. Kind of like your marathon yesterday, yep. Rich, yep. because you were injured <laughs> and I was sick and injured prior to mine. So, there we go. There we go. Yeah. So you were. What'd you run your first one in? 525. 
You got it done. So you should be way more encouraged than you actually are, bro. You that did a four fifty eight, man. That four fifty eight. Yes, sir. I just wanted to get it done, bro. Yeah, it was not the time I was looking for. But right. you just did another one and you like crushed it. I did. I did. It was it was my goal time. I wanted to run a sub four. That's what I was training for. I hired a running coach to help me get to that place. And the a thing, running he, coach. Oh yeah, he's a professional triathlete, and so he runs. He's run the Boston in a. Uh, sub three, I think a two fifty. He Jeez. finished the, the Boston in. So what is that like? Is he running with you, or is he just giving you a plan? Uh, mostly a plan, but it's a little more involved. So he'll check in every single day or every three days. Like, how you feeling? What's going on? What are you eating? How you sleeping? I mean, everything is about that race and getting you to achieve a PB, a personal best, yeah. as they say in the running culture. Guys, we don't expect everyone to understand this, but I mean. Yeah. Once again, deep calls the deep. Right. As runners, you know, we talk <laughs> as, about these as things. As runners. So, yeah, man. So I, I, I was training, hoping for a 415, Rich. In fact, my coach told me, he said, you know, if we hit a 415, it will be an amazing race. And I said, no, I'm going sub four. And he goes, you know, we might want to back off the expectation of a sub four. Yeah. But if you do get there, then that would be amazing. Well, at the 13.1 mark, I looked down at my watch, and it was an hour and 57 minutes. So I said, I've set the conditions. I can do it. Sub four is possible. And I teared up at 13.1 thinking about it. Really? Oh, yeah, bro. I got emotional. I was like, <gasps> you know how when you, like, yeah. want to cry? I got emotional at the end, but I, I was just scared at 13. I was like, I can't believe I got to do it at 13. I, don't, you, I didn't have enough self-awareness. for five weeks. Dang, man. That, that's what it was, man. So that, that, that'll that put the fear of God in you. When you run, do you run alone? Yeah, mostly. Unless I train with my wife. She's a runner, too. Oh, yeah. So she just finished a half marathon. Good for her. Or, or thereabouts. Because, I need to uh, pray for my wife. My wife is just uh, coming around, about to turn 40. She's like, I think I might start working out. I'm like, it's probably a smart choice, babe. Hey, you know, but we're blessed, man. <laughs> we got beautiful wives. Look at how he got out of that. He's like, I'm not going to go down that route, man. No, no, no. Uh, I never thought that she would run with me, but, you know, the she way I talked her into it was said, let's run the Disney Marathon. Well, I don't know what this is. Yeah, so there is a marathon at Walt Disney World. All the characters and stuff? Oh, yeah. So, like, every Goofy's mile. out there? Like... Oh, yeah. You can stop. You can take photos with them. Of course, I never stopped because I had a goal, but, like, if if we were running the half together, like we yeah. may stop, take some photos. Is Mickey wearing what, what's what's he in like Brooks or what's he wearing? You know, probably Hocus. Okay, probably Hocus. You okay. know, I never looked. Stability but, shoe or kind of like more of a neutral. I think I think probably a speed shoe. Yeah, you yeah. know, being Mickey that. Mouse and everything, he's a mouse kind of fast. That's so, pretty sick. I don't know. So why did that excite her? The Disney? She's a big Disney person. Oh yeah, we're Disney really? adults. Her more than me. I think but Disney's we do demonic. Have, you think so? Yeah, very yeah, much. Yeah, it might be, but we, we kind of overlook it. it. We keep boycotting it. Really? But but it hasn't changed anything. But I'm gonna you know. Right. Do you boycott other things? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Bro, I know. I How do you a, change stuff? Boycott Disney. Boycott Disney, nah, Target, boycott everybody, Disney. right? So, no, honestly, we got a lot of flack in the DMs. Because Why don't we, we go? go why, we're in Miami. Let's go up to Disney today, bro. Easy. I think, man, like. You want to? Let, let, let's, let's fly up, bro. I say we, no, we just drive. We run. We, drive we can run, we'll run, bro. Up. As slow as I'm running my marathon, bro. We'll get you up can there get to Disney week. and back. <laughs> Literally, bro, I got done in five hours. I was like, bro, I could have made it to Disney from Miami. It's long. I could have, I could have ran from Miami, it's long. been in line in Space Mountain, rode the ride, and then yep. that that absolutely that's the whole situation. Absolutely. Crazy. But the reason why marathons are hard is because you run out of glycogen. See, you start dropping stuff like that. I that, is that tongues? What was that? Yeah, yeah. Glyc how yeah. do I say that? Yeah, yeah, glycogen. Okay. It, it, it's it, Hebrew it's, for it's yeah, for uh holiness. Yes. No, I'm just kidding, bro. It's it's a basically it's like what your muscles store yeah. that give you energy. Okay. So you run off of glycogen, and when you run out of glycogen, you can't run anymore. Brother, I dropped like nine gels in this thing, dude. Oh yeah. Oh it, yeah. It was hot in Miami. Yeah. And we were I was in a zone five. For, yeah, I was bro. telling you this for seventy five percent of my no, run. No, no. I'm too old for that. Yeah. Yeah, you should have slowed down and, and went six hours, bro. Hey, hey, I got that dog. In <laughs> yeah, you do, bro. <laughs> have you ever seen that clip on social? That goes, dog, Rich, dog. He's naming those people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dog. Me and my friends just send each other <laughs> I that. Like that. Just we got two seconds of dog. <laughs> yeah, I like yeah, that. Yeah, man. So when you're running, um, what – you listen if you're with your wife. You guys are talking. Or we you guys, talk. Are you yeah. listening to stuff? We 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 pray in the Holy Ghost, man. You know we're real spiritual like that. Really? No. Oh, we talk. 
talk. We talk. But yeah. if you're by yourself, you listen to stuff. I do sometimes. Sometimes I listen to the uh, Voo Church podcast. I love you know, him, get man. a little inspiration. I listen to uh, our buddy Nick Bear. I listen to his podcast. That's our guy, man. That's our guy, Nick. If you're listening, please send gels. Shout out, man. We need some more go gels, man. We, hey, man. Just we love you. We bless you. Gels. Yes, bro. I'm gonna hit you with the plug right quick, though. Tell me. You need to use the uh, Nutter Butter Bar protein that he has and mix it with some oats. I've had the Nutter Butter stuff, but mix it with some oats in the morning, bro. It'll get you right, especially before a run. Man, you know stuff. You got that wisdom, <laughs> bro. Spirit's resting on me, bro. bro it's that I, mantle, a Nick when, Bear. When, when, when do you when do you feel with that? Morning? Yeah, so morning. So you want to make sure you eat enough before a run. So okay. you probably felt really, really exhausted at like mile 17, yep. 18, because that's when you're out of glycogen. Brother 17 yep. was the devil. Yep, that's when you like, hit the wall. I was like, this just got hard. Yep, that's when you hit the wall. Yep. And, and you know what I said to myself? I borrowed this from— I'm a dog. <laughs> dog. <laughs> what, 17, bro. I borrowed this from this um, a girl, she she goes by the name of, of Track Club Babe on Instagram. She's cool. She's a believer. Okay. I think her name is Kim. And her husband is an Olympic qualifier marathoner. Wow. And there was this clip on social media that I saw of them training together where he was coaching her. And he asked her at like mile 18. He was like, you hurting right now? And, of course, she can't talk. You know, so she's like, you know. And he said, you hurting right now? He said, it's your job to hurt. Can you do your job? That'll preach. Bro. And so I was thinking the whole time, mile 17, 18, can I do my job? Do your job. Do your job. Let me tell you what I was thinking. I want to get in my bed. <laughs> I want to go sleepy with my wifey. Um, that's, that's why you did your time. I think, I mean, I learned so much doing it, and uh, I'm not sure if I'm becoming like a runner all the way. Yes. I do love the idea, like, like fitness is just a big deal to me. Health is a big deal to me. I just love the idea of being able to, at any moment, go out and run eight miles. I mean, that's yes, pretty cool. It is. That's cool, like, how your dad would get up and run five miles like that every day. I think that's a really mm -hmm. cool thing to watch. Tell me a little bit about, like, because I don't know much about where you grew up, oh, your yeah. story a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I've kind of heard, like, little things from here and there, like clips and stuff like that. But sure. Tell me a little bit of your story yeah, if you yeah. don't mind. So, so I grew up in West Kentucky. Yeah. I, I mentioned this earlier. It's not a city. It's a village. Population 600, Sacramento, Kentucky. 90% farmland. So I grew up in the sticks, man. Jeez. So like a lot of people listen to me. They hear my accent and they think I sound like Theo Vaughn, the comedian. I love that dude. Yeah. So my new nickname is uh, Theology Vaughn. I like that. Yeah, man. I, like I actually that. met Theo recently, which that's another story, but uh, it was like a, you know, fullness I had dinner of with time. him one night. We had a great time. Stop. Yep. Really? 2019. Spent a whole evening with him. This is like before, so, like, this is like when he was just doing, the, I, I, yeah, he wouldn't know me, but I'm just saying. Really? Yeah. That's a whole story. We, we won't get into it. But okay, just, that's why. I had to one-up as soon as you said it. I was like, ah, but I should tell him now. But uh, He's looking for the Lord. That's what he says. He's a good dude. Bro. Right? Yeah, he's a good guy. Deep he's soul. A good, guy. good guy. Good guy. So I grew up in Kentucky, man. Um, uh, I was there at PK. Uh, Come so, on. So, Shout so, out. Yep. Shout out to all the PKs. That's Pastor's kids, preacher kid. That's right. I got a tattoo right here on my calf. PK? Uh, PK. It's a fishbowl. Life in a fishbowl really? as a PK. Show me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see it right here? Oh, bro. Yeah, so so me and my boy Andrew Damasio got the exact same tattoo. You know the exact Andrew same Damasio. Spot, bro. Yeah, his dad is my bishop, bro. I didn't see. Yes, sir. I love those people. Yes, sir. The Damasios, man. Good people. So we got that tattoo together and uh, grew up a PK. Uh, but. Um, I was I was a prodigal when I was 16 years old. I was playing uh, basketball quite a bit. Just got, started running with the wrong people. Uh, ended up becoming a full blown drug addict by the time I was 17, 18 years old. Uh, moved out when I was still in high school. Lived you, in a crack tell house. Tell me about that. What? Do you, what? A crap. How, how does this yeah. happen? Tell me about that. Yeah, uh, it's a wild. It's it's a wild journey to get there. But you start smoking weed. Yeah, it started with uh, weed and pills and and liquor and and parties and stuff like that. But by the time I was seventeen, man, I was a full blown addict. I was shooting up heroin, meth. Um, yeah, I was in a mental institution when I was eighteen years old. When you were growing up, yes. you knew your parents were instilling right and wrong. Absolutely. What? Give me, like, try to go back. I, I kind of was a little bit of a prodigal, but nothing sure, to sure. this point. What, what's, like, kind of in your mind as you start to make some of those decisions? Like, you know this is wrong, but 
What is oh, it you're looking for? What is it you want? Like, I, I, I was running as fast as I could get from God because I knew I had a call of God on my life to preach the gospel. I knew that from the time I was 12, 13 years old. And I heard the voice of the Lord in my dad's church calling me to preach the gospel. And I told the Lord then, no, mm. I will not do it because here's what I said. Preachers are poor. Mm. And I want to be a professional basketball player, Lord. And I don't want to be poor. I want to be rich. I want to be famous. I want to play basketball. I want to travel the world. I don't want to live in Sacramento, Kentucky and preach the gospel. And so I'm not doing it. So I intentionally turned my back on Jesus. So I just ignored everything that he would say to me. Totally believed in him. Totally believed but in him, man. I'm not doing this. Yeah. What was your relationship with your dad like? Um, I mean, it, 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 it deteriorated uh, quite a bit because I just hurt my parents' heart so much, you know, in the process of disobeying them and abusing drugs and What was his response and, to you throughout that whole time? Um, really awesome. He loved me the entire time. You know, sometimes it was tough love, but he loved me. I remember calling him one Wednesday afternoon from jail, and I said, Dad, I, I, I was arrested again. Can you please come pick me up? And he said, Son, I'm about to preach. He, he said, I'm walking upstairs to preach. I can't come get you right now. And he said, I think you need to stay there for a little bit and just think about what's happening in your life. Because he knew it was a way to get me clean. Yeah, You know, so I, I, I was arrested more times than I can count, Rich. I was shot at uh, all of my best friends at the time. A lot of them went to prison. A lot of them killed. Uh, my roommate actually was shot point blank range in the chest, died in the street. And I wasn't with them, thankfully. But that was my life prior to meeting Jesus. What was all the violence due to? Uh, gang, gang activity. You wouldn't think that being in West Kentucky, but there's a, there's a pretty strong drug route that comes between wow. Memphis and Chicago where I lived in Kentucky. And so I ran with a street gang. So this starts beginning at 15, 16? Yeah. Yeah, that's when the addiction started, sort of evolved Can into that. Can you tell me a little about addiction? Sure. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, the, it's some of the process of like how you get there. Like, I don't yeah. understand how someone starts shooting heroin. Yeah, it just sort of you sort of devolve into that because you kind of chase the high, right? So at first it was just weed and pills, and then it became, uh, you know, cocaine and heroin. And now they got fentanyl, but I never did that. When at the was time. the first time you did heroin? Uh, when I was 18 years old. Were you scared attempting it? Uh, no. Was it something that you thought about before? Like, hey, I'm going to do this in two weeks. or I'm gonna, No, no, no. I never thought impulse. that I would do that. Yeah, but I you was would, just... Was there ever a time you're like, I'll never do that? Oh, of course. That kind of stuff. Even when you're partying, you're like, I'm never going to do heroin. I'm never doing that. I, so you saw heroin around you before yeah. you ever did it? Yeah, yeah. So I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll get high or I'll drink, but I'll never do that. You know, but eventually you just kind of chase the high and you get to a place people call addiction a, a disease for a reason. And I was in that place, Rich. Jeez. Like, I mean, I know what it's like to feel crazy. And that's one of the reasons why I was in the mental institution, because they were trying to get me clean. So I was in a state hospital, you know, so I was there for a whole month. And then I spent quite a bit of time in jail, you know, kind of in and out different stints. I've been arrested a lot, you know. So, what were you usually getting arrested for? Uh, all kinds of stuff, mostly violence and, and drugs. Yeah, so one of the times that I, I did get arrested, um, I, was, um, I had a warrant out for attempted murder because there was a violent altercation, altercation that took place between me and another guy. But thankfully, because of my dad, you know, and, and because the guy, I guess, found it in his heart to testify uh, the truth uh, it was actually, I was able to get out of that situation because what they were looking for me for was not true, but nonetheless, that was what my life was like prior to Jesus. That's why I tell you the story. Yeah. When you, when you're like on heroin, you're mm -hmm. doing drugs, do you still have the ability to be self-aware to say, I've got a real problem or is it all denial? Like, are you, are you still doing normal things? Were you still playing basketball, like shooting heroin? Were you still no. being... No, I think once you get to that point, I think the best, I think most people do understand they have a problem, but they don't care because there's no way you could not be aware of the reality that you have a problem because everything about you changes. Your physical appearance changes. The way that you think changes. Um, I mean, my parents told me the three or four times that they saw me in four or five years, like when I would come around, like. I would have a lot of like tremors and stuff. And then I would also forget what I was saying. And so those years of my life are really kind of blacked out. Like I Dear do remember God. certain things, but they're really kind of blacked out. And like right now when I'm sitting here talking with you, like mm -hmm. you're so sharp and mm -hmm. you have such a 
great skill of communication and you're mm. fast and you're witty, all of that kind of like um, personality set that yeah. was all in you way back then. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I've I've always been a a, a fun going guy. You know what I mean? Like I've always enjoyed uh, being the life of the party and cutting up and having fun and and uh, you know I think some of that was still there. But it was definitely suppressed, man. A lot of darkness, bro. A lot of darkness. That's what a lot of people don't understand about drug usage is there's a lot of demonic stuff embedded within that, man. And so I remember even even doing all that stuff, Jesus never stopped chasing me. Mm. Jesus never stopped talking to me, Rich. Was, was interesting, like, I'm 39. I'll be 40 uh, this year. Same. Let's go. Yes, sir. What, what are we doing? 40, man. I don't know, man. I told Disney? my dude we might go to Italy or something. He's turning forty two, you oh, know. So we got I gotta up the game. It can't be Disney. No, no, yeah. no. We gotta we got, go. We gotta, we gotta go to Europe or something, bro. We're gonna do something big. We're gonna do something big. But like when I'm listening to you talk, maybe um uh, we had kids later. I think mm. your your oldest is nine. Yeah. So you got a little yeah. head start on me, but our, our oldest just turned six. So we kind of started having children a little bit later in life. And it's all so interesting, like becoming a parent, becoming a father. Because I would have heard this story even just six years ago, and my heart breaks even just like mm-hmm. hearing you share it. Mm-hmm. And talk about it from you, from your perspective. Yeah. But it's interesting when you have kids. Yeah. How, as you're telling that story, I'm like, how did your parents yeah. survive that? The love of a, of a parent to a child watching yeah. their kid go through that. Mm-hmm. Like, is there any um, lessons there from a, from a parenting standpoint? Like, maybe if yeah. someone's out there with a kid who's going through something like that, like... I meet people with kids that are going through that all the time. Jesus. Uh, all the time. Because they hear my story, so they come up in the altar and they say, hey, I, my child has this, this issue, yeah. and I want you to pray with me right now for that issue. And one of the things that I tell them is that you don't need Jesus to touch them in the place of their pain. You just need Jesus to touch them. You know, and so I, I think a lot of mm. times people think, well, he's got to heal my child of their addiction. But maybe he'll do that later. He just, your child just needs to encounter Jesus in one way or the other. And he'll figure out the timing of how they heal and everything. So I would say that you cannot outrun the prayers of a praying mama. Mm. My, my mom interceded for me to be touched by Jesus. There's no doubt she prayed into my, you know, symptomatic conditions, but she prayed for me to encounter the Lord every single day. And so that went from 15 to 18 or how, how long was 21. that? 21. So yeah. a, a solid six years. Yeah, man. Of yeah. running. Abuse. Yeah. Abuse. Yeah. Should have, should have died. Should have died. Overdosed three times. Uh, multiple Dear car Jesus, crashes. Bro. I didn't know all this. Yeah, suicidal. Uh, put a gun in my mouth, and and the only reason I didn't pull the trigger for whatever reason, like I was just thinking about my grandmother. So uh, that's why I didn't kill myself. And what happened at twenty one? Twenty one, man. Jesus came and got me, bro. I. I this is not going to make sense to some people. I get that, you know, but I, I was a PK. So I understood the presence and the power of God, even though I didn't want to be around Jesus. I didn't want to read the Bible. I didn't want to go to church. I, I isolated myself from all of that. I still knew the presence of God. I knew the power of God was real. And I knew Jesus loved me because even in the midst of my drug usage and telling him, I don't want to speak to you. I don't want to follow you. He always spoke to me. And I always heard him, you know, and it would be like drives and he would speak to me and tell me to come home. And so, man, I was 21 years old. SWAT team just kicked in the door uh, down the street at my friend's house. We were selling drugs together. So at this time, I'd become a successful drug dealer. All right. So I just counted out one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in cash on my kitchen table. My friend had just been arrested coming back from a drug deal in Alabama. So I'm by myself sitting in my drug infested apartment, selling cocaine out of the cabinet, growing weed in the closet. And I see somebody walk past my window and I was like, oh, SWAT's here. Right. I got guns. I got drugs. I got cash. I got everything. SWAT is here. So I go. I look out the window. No one is there. Right. So I'm like, hold on. I saw somebody. I know somebody's there. Maybe they're hiding. I go to the people. I look out the door and I'm like, no one is there. So I take a step back and I'm thinking I'm not I'm not high. You know, I'm in my right mind enough to know somebody just walked past my window and I didn't see Jesus like I'm seeing you, Rich. But I knew Jesus walked through the door, walked into that apartment and spoke to me very clearly. And he said, in six months, you will be dead or in prison unless you come home to me right now. 
I fell on my knees. I lifted my hands. I knew enough to do that. I repented of my sins, and I accepted Jesus. That is how I got saved, man. That's your encounter? That's how I got saved. No Bible, no, no preacher, no church, no TBN, nothing, bro. Just, just Jesus came and got me. You know, I tell people, oh. I thought SWAT was coming to arrest me, man. It was Jesus Whoa. coming to arrest me, bro. That's crazy. I've been preaching ever since then, since that day. Well, I was going to say, what, what, what happened? Yeah. Did you go call your dad? Did you like, yeah. What was your next step out of there? Yeah. You um, moved out of that place? You I stayed did. there? I did, yeah. I called my best friend who was holding a bunch of money for me, and I said, hey, bro, um, I, I've had an encounter with Jesus. Uh, I quit. Uh, please bring me the money you have for me. I'm moving. And I, here's what I told him, which is a special thing to me. Um, I'm going to move home, and I'm going to be a good son. To my parents, they've never had a son, a good son, and I'm going to be a good big brother to my three little brothers because they've never had a good big brother. So that, so that's what I did, and um, and bro, I was in full time vocational ministry six months later, pre preaching the gospel. What happened with your addictions? Gone, immediately. No cravings, no 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 withdrawals, nothing. No AA. I had done no, AA and NA prior to that because I was been forced to. You've been to rehab to. programs, or I'd done all that, nothing. So you free, bro. You get up, you, set free. Six months later, you start your preaching. Yeah, where at? Uh, multiple places. Uh, some in public. So like I used to preach at rest stops. This and, is all in Kentucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and at emergency rest rooms. <laughs> yeah, because because I, I didn't, you know. I, I read in the Bible, man, Jesus turned a lakeside into a lecture, and I'm like, shoot, I'll turn an ER into a pulpit, man. Let's go. Like, these people in here, they know they need prayer. You Let's know, go. so I just thought it would be a good place. But I used to go and stand by the water fountain at rest stops, and when people come get a drink, I'd say, if you drink of that water, you're going to thirst again. Let's go. And that was my tactic, you know. <laughs> I like that. So that's, that's, that's what I did. Point. One time I was preaching, uh, we used to do this young adult ministry, and we were like, you know, Revival, man. People started yeah. coming in like crazy. I remember I got done preaching. This dude coming to me, he's like, man, Pastor, would you pray for my shadow? I'm like, excuse me? Hold on. He was like, well, there's this girl next do door in my cubicle at the office, and she's got cancer, but she don't, won't let me pray for her. And so I was reading the Bible that when their shadows would touch them, yes. people would get healed. He was yes. like, so I thought maybe you could pray for my shadow. I was like, bro, you ought to pray for me, man. Yes. Like, I don't know if I got that kind of faith. Come was, on, bro. It's powerful, man. Yes, sir. Ain't nothing like a new Christian, man. Nothing like a new Christian, man. You preach to everybody. Whew. That new, first I love, love new is Christians. fiery, bro. That's what churches need, new Christians. Yes, man. sir. Yes, you start sir. getting some new Christians in there, they start believing the book, man. Oh, they yeah. start believing that stuff. Preaching out water fountains? What are we talking about? Right, yeah. What yeah. are we talking about? So help me now a little bit. So you're 21. You're in Kentucky. How, yes. how we get all the way to Nashville? Like, Bro, crazy story, man. So yeah. I actually moved to Africa as a missionary. So I moved to Mozambique, Africa, and I served there for two years. And then after that... Why, why did you go to Mozambique, Africa? Uh, because I heard of this lady uh, named Heidi Baker. I don't know if you've heard of her before, but I intercepted a VHS tape from another pastor of her preaching about being martyred. And I thought, you know, that's the way I want to love Jesus. I don't know nothing about her or her ministry, but I want to love Jesus in such a way that I would be willing to spill my blood for what I believe. Wow. So if that's what she preaches, I'll just go serve her. And my dad said, yeah, sure, go, you know, bless me to go. My church sent me. And so um, I didn't think I would really be a missionary. I just wanted to learn. Uh, but after that, um, I asked them, I said, can I go to India because I saw a news report on CNN that said there are over, um, m there, there are multi-millions of child prostitutes in the nation of India. And so if there's any place that needs the gospel, it would be India. And so I would like to go there and rescue kids from human trafficking. So, so, I, so I moved to India. Were you married at this time? No, no, I hadn't met my wife. So you're single. Single. How old are you? 24. So you're just in Kentucky for three years. Yeah. And you're out to yeah. Africa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you get over there. Get over there, decide I'm going to start a nonprofit organization because I know people want tax-deductible donations. I didn't care about any of that. But I did it, and then I moved to India and um, went to this, they call it a village, but it, 8 million people live there. And, um, <sighs> man, I just started working with the guy I met on Facebook just trying to find children who were enslaved in human trafficking and rescue them. And how did that go? Yeah, we rescued over 400 kids in two and a half years. 
And are you doing like Sound of Freedom stuff, or, what, um, or this is n- no? It's it's a it's it's actually pretty wild, bro. So we found a place where um, a lot of children were being trafficked, oftentimes by their own parents, right? So they were being Dang. sold into forced labor camps, and they were enslaved to actually mine granite, marble, and slate. So that's one of the reasons why, like, if you're watching, like, I don't buy granite, marble, and slate from India uh, for that reason because I know. Um, I n- not not that I buy a lot of granite, you know, but like I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't, yeah. you know, because I see like there are children our children's age Jeez, that are working man. in those conditions, right? And so uh, we met some kids working in those conditions, and we asked if we could, you know, find out who they were enslaved by. Mm. And so we found some people to talk to, and we started offering them money for the, the kids' freedom. And so that's how the, the process got started. And initially they just threatened us. Yeah. Like, absolutely not. You guys are Christians. Yeah. We know who you are. We're not we going to let you to, come yeah. here and try to ruin you our business. You. You're ruining our business because these children, man, they're it's like that story. Remember in Acts when like they cast that demon out exactly. and they're all mad. They're like, bro, exactly. you just took our business. It, that's exactly right. So, so they're used as slaves during the day and prostitutes at night. So you're over there. What brings you back to the States? Just, I needed help. Because I was by myself mostly. And so I would have like short-term uh, visitors who would stay with me, but yeah. they were very soft. So I didn't want to run with them. I needed some like real, you know, dogs. Some you know, dog. dogs. Some dogs man, with me. Dog, bro. And so I started a base in Nashville, Tennessee. How'd you missions. pick Nashville? Uh, that was my airport. It was just the easy airport. to uh, Easy airport, you bro. You, that, we ain't got no airport in the sticks. Do you still go back there? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, man, that's where, like, my family's from, and my grandmothers live there. And no, I'm saying, do you ever go back to... Uh, India. Yeah. No, not really. Not really? No, I don't really, I don't really want to right now. You don't want to? No. How come? It's a lot of, lot of memories, you know? It's, um, it's good to testify to the kids you, you were able to, to free, uh, but it's another thing to remember the kids you couldn't. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's tough. I don't want to go back right now Uh, but maybe eventually i will you know i have an opportunity to go back i have some friends i've been invited back i just i haven't gone yet because you feel like there's still work to do there but you don't all the way have the means to do it yeah timing i think it's deep yeah so i have gone i've taken my wife we have gone and and uh so i I think god will open a door tell Uh, me how you met your wife yeah, man, we met on our very first day of our church. Of course, at the time, we weren't calling it a church. We were calling it a missions base, you know? And she was home for Christmas break Dude, from college. Dude, I love stories like this. I love churches that formed out of the weirdest oh, beginnings. bro. Your church, so it's this is what I'm trying to figure out. This is, this is how the church began. It yes, was sir. a missions base. A missions base, man. a church. This is I, a missions base. Yeah, no, it wasn't a church. I had no interest in being a pastor, bro. I didn't want to be a pastor. Not in America. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm like, I'm, what is this? Sleeping beauty, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is like the base that you're kind of teaching the word. Yes. Tell them what we're trying to do. Yeah. Okay. Sunday night wor- worship gatherings. And I really didn't preach a lot. Um, I, had a, I had a few friends and we just took turns. So I'd preach like once every six weeks, but I would go in and out to India every 40, 50 days. Dang, bro. I love this. For five, five years, bro. So my church planting journey was a five-year journey. Not the ark plan, you know what I mean? They're totally different. Dude, I needed help. So tell me what Sunday nights looked like back then. Oh, Like wild. tell me what your flow is. Like chaos, bro. There was no flow. There's no planning center. What is your background? Like, it's like... like Holiness Pentecostal, There we bro. go. That's what I'm looking Holiness for. Holiness Pentecostal. Of course, Holy man. Holy rolling tongue you talking. You got that oil, bro. Brush Arbor revival. Let's go, yeah, bro. Man. You got that. So, Sunday nights, tell me, there's no PCO. No, 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 no. It was no, no. just like, we would open up. Um, you have a start time? Yeah, yeah, yeah kind of. Like, hey, come to the house at 7. And so, like, we would hang out for a little bit, <laughs> and it would get full. Bro, we'd have 100 people in here just, just get, yeah. it, you know, like, worshiping. And so I'd kick off, and I'd say, if anybody has a testimony, open mic. So people would come up, testify. All right, we're going to start worship. Then we would worship. People get up and just say wild, weird stuff. Oh, sometimes it was terrible. Like, you know? just like. Oh, yeah. Like, man, hey. Let's I got a prophetic seat. word from the Lord. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm going to play bongos tonight. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like crazy stuff, Rich. <laughs> I'm going to play the bongos tonight. Oh, yeah. And, and the yeah. Holy Spirit's going to fall. It's a prophetic beat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bro, it's there's like, no rhythm. Yeah, it's like you're yeah. not doing okay. that. You know what so, I mean? So you got, you got, mm-hmm. P- and you then don't, so, got, anyone got a little, little yeah, testimony? Yeah, testimony. Okay, then and we what? would worship. Yep. And so we just worship until, you know, I felt Do like. Do you leave uh, worship? No, 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 no. no. 
But you always had people around. You could, you always know, had yeah. people around who loved Jesus, who could play and sing a little bit. So, you know, we would have worship, and then and then I would teach, or one of my friends would teach, and it wasn't really a, a teaching. It was just kind of look like a, a exhortation. Exhortation. There we go. No notes, really. You yeah. know. And then we would then we would pray for people who wanted prayer, and usually we would end around three a.m. Bro. Yeah, two or three a.m. Just worship, man. Just go for it. How is the word spreading? Just people going, oh, come over to come over to Lyle's house. Yeah, he's about to go on a trip. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. we need to we need the glory of God before he goes, and exactly. we're sending him out in strength. Yeah, exactly. So they would pray for yep. me and send me out, and I would take a, a few people with me. So so I was trying to train people to become missionaries. There we go. Right? So so I would talk about martyrdom, and yeah, a lot of people don't like that sermon. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> yeah. everybody wants to be like, I can change the world like Paul, but they forget Paul was martyred, and and so you know, like I I, I would talk about that stuff, and so that's how we would build uh, trips. So your wife shows up to one of these. Yeah, Glory uh, uh, did not want to be there at all because she thought this is some weird house church, like they're all hurt and offended and I don't want to go, but like her friend came to yep. him. So she came and I noticed her, of course, and I'm like, hey, you know, what's up? Like, uh, what are you doing? Like, what's happening in your life? And she's like, actually, I am not moving back to Nashville for another five years at least. So I kind of felt like she was saying, don't even think about it. Yeah, buddy, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, so, so she was just visiting from out of town. Exactly. She was with a friend. Yeah, 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 exactly. So she was living in California. You know, I met my wife in time. Nashville. Stop. No, you did not. Are we brothers? Where? Are we brothers? We must be. I feel like, man. Yeah. It's like my brother. I'm thinking we hey. might need to build some bunk beds. Hey, you a dog. Spread out for a little room for activities. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You a dog. dog. Um, my wife's from Shreveport, and we met in Nashville. She was making music, and my brother was making music, and they had a concert, and she came to the concert that he was doing. And we no. Met. Yeah. So that's Shreveport, Louisiana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used yeah, to preach yeah. in Shreveport, Louisiana. Where'd you preach at? At Shreveport? a church called Faith Tabernacle. Woo! Oh, Yeah. That 318, man. Oh, yeah, I don't even remember what the bishop's name was, but he was a bishop. My, my father-in-law pastor's there. My brother-in-law pastor's there. Shreveport. Today? Shre Shreveport Community Church. First Assembly is what it used to be called, yeah? No way. Good old, we're old, old Assemblies of God people. Oh, you know? yeah. A.G. But I got my, I got my wife's number okay. in Nashville, and um, I actually got it. I, I didn't even How? ask her for it. I got it from a, her friend. It was really weird. Then my brother, we were, he thought it was funny. He called her from my phone like 28 times. She had 28 missed calls. I was like, bro, you blew it. That's not funny. You blew it. It wasn't funny at all. Yeah. It was scary. The fact that she called me back is really a, you know, I'm kind of worried about her. I don't know why yeah, she Yeah, would, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a fine line between, yeah. you know, seeking and stalking. And so, hey, uh, deep down, bro. Yeah, she, yeah. she wanted it. She wanted me. She, hey, oh, yeah. She wanted the dog. Oh, she, she, Rich, she saw that, that dog. part. Cut that yeah, part. Yeah, she, she saw, saw the that dog. dog. So you get her number. You're hitting her up. Oh, we can't say that. Yeah, they no, can't say that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's easy. Yeah. It's easy. Yeah. You start calling her and... I actually I actually Facebooked her. There you go. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't have her number. I Facebooked her. And, and the reason I did that was because there was a there was a lady who used to come to our gatherings. And she was like in her, in her, in her 50s or 60s. And she said, you know what? You need to get married. You need to get married. I said, well, I'm trying. You yeah. know, I'm trying to get married. I, I don't... I don't have, I don't see anybody. I'm traveling a lot and everything. Yeah. And she said, well, you've always been traveling. Uh, I think you need to be, I think you need to become comfortable with a distance relationship because as much as you move around, you should reach out to, to, a, to somebody. Is there anybody you met? And I said, well, actually there is somebody. And she said, you know, it's, I, I love to hear you say that because I saw somebody at our gathering the other night that I Stop. thought you should be interested in. And she had an iPad and pulled up Instagram, and it was my wife's Stop. profile. And she was like, this girl, I feel like the Lord would really bless you pursuing her. You're like, somebody get the bongos. We have the word of the Lord. Oh, we got the word of the Lord. We need a bongo anointing in here. Bro, all of a sudden, Matthew McConaughey comes in. <laughs> boop, 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 boop. Um, so was it, what, it yep. took her a while to, yeah, to fall in love with you? Yeah, well, she pretended she didn't like me, but, yeah, you know, it. I knew that she did. She said, it wasn't really a, mem a memorable interaction. I just, your accent, you know. She acted like she didn't like it, but she knew. Yeah, yeah. That buttery. Hey, uh, I love that accent, bro. That's it, man. That's it, bro. I feel like you're my brother, man. It, we, we are brothers, bro. No doubt it, about it, it. It's, it's undeniable. <laughs> when did when did the home missions base become a church? Yeah, so I met Banning Leapshire in 2015, and um, and he said, I man, love that, you need man. to plant a church. That's what he said. Yeah, he's like, what are you doing? Like, What was your framework back then of like pastors and churches? You just thought it was like... Soft? Oh, yeah. You bro. thought this is like weak. Like, y'all are like Soft America. Soft melted ice cream, man. Like, I do not want any part of this. I don't want to sit here. I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to be martyred. Do you think you still, that's still your tension? 
No. No. Mm-mm. No, man, I think pastors are some of the most amazing people in the world. Man, the, the, what pastors have to go through, yeah. what they do every week, man. I, I don't care where you are. If you're pastoring people and you're laying down your life for the sheep, you're, you're, you're a legend in my book. Why do you think that you had that kind of like idea that this is um, soft and this is mm-hmm. the real mission over here? What, what, what do you think that all came from? A lot of missionaries think that, and so they propagate that narrative. So when you hang and roll with missionaries, mm, they kind of make fun of uh, uh, churches in America that's a lot. That's the easy work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that's a light a, work. That's a light work, you know, like we're doing the gospel. You know, and so I, I didn't have any other framework to, to work with. And so I kind of took that on it's and I thought that way. And, and then once I realized it's not that way at all, because mm. I started to get to know pastors in America and I realized, man, like, man, it doesn't matter where you go, man. People be peopling, yep. you know, like yep. it, very good. They're, they're hurt, man. They're, they're, they're lost. They're, they're addicted. They're, yep. they're strung out. They need help. Their marriages are broken. They're prodigals just like I was, you know, so. Um, I think at the end of the day, man, no matter where you go, a soul is a soul. And so, Banny in 2015 says you need to plant a church. Absolutely. And when did you do? When did you do it? Uh, we we uh, launched on September the 11th, um, 2016. Beautiful. Yeah. And yeah. why'd you name it Legacy? Uh, because my my dad was pastoring at the time and said, you know, I want to rebrand our church and. Um, and I said, well, we're launching one, so why don't we just call our church whatever you call your church? Because I wanted to serve my father. I like you, man. Yeah, so that's why we called it Legacy, because he said, I'm going to call my church Legacy. I said, okay, well, we're Legacy. And is that his church in Kentucky? Yeah, yeah, he's recently retired. And is that under your leadership now? Yeah, my little brother pastors the church. Come on. Yeah. How old's your brother? Yeah, he is uh, 33. So cool. Yeah. My little brother pastors a church in New York, and he's... Probably 33. Really? This is getting weird, we man. Are definitely brothers, man. God, like, are you just... Did we just become best friends? I, I just... Man, Lord, what are you doing right now? What are you yeah, saying? Right. He's saying go, 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 something. Go, 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 go. Um, I can so, hear the bongos. Yeah, I hear the... Bro, I can that's hear. my favorite. That is my favorite. There's an acoustic... Um, <laughs> so, talk to me about planning yeah. the church and, yeah. and how it's been. Yeah, so... Oh, when did y'all uh, get married? Yeah, so we got married in, in 2013, actually. So so my wife was willing to a- adopt my crazy missions-based yeah. missions lifestyle. And, like, because of some of the testimonies of what God was doing in India, I was also traveling and preaching. So a lot of young adult gatherings, some churches, and then I would need to do that to raise support for the kids. So she was Man. like, it's cool. Uh, but we had our Sunday gatherings. And then, yep, September 2016, we launched and bro, I had no idea how to pastor a church. So like you said, planning center, right? Like yeah. that's my, oh, I guess we should figure out how to use planning center. And then a pastor said, well, you need a confidence monitor. And I said, what's a confidence monitor? You know, he's like, yeah, it's yeah. a TV in the back of the room to tell you what to do. And I'm like, what is that? You know, so it probably took me until I met Dr. Frank Damasio until I understood what church was about. I had no ecclesiology, bro, until I met Frank. He's special. He's very special. So he taught me what I know. That about man's brilliant, church. by the way. Frank Damasio. Good old uh was it what what we city was it City Bible? City Bible, now, yeah. I think it's called Mana House or something. Yeah, it's called Mana House now. Yeah. Um, Portland Bible College. I mean, I used and that to go whole there crew. Years and years ago, man. That I know. Guy, I know. That guy's got a teaching for everything. Everything. That guy's got 17 points for everything, bro. Everything, bro. It pulls out outlines. It's like, hey, have you ever heard my teaching on this? You ever yep. heard my teaching on manna? My eight-part series on manna? I'm oh, like, yeah. I didn't know you, there was. I thought there was like four verses about manna. He's this written got, 60 books. Whew. He's a goat, man. Like, So if he I starts ever, helping you build. Yeah, he does. He does. Yeah, so so I just met him kind of through a friend, and and he said, you need to meet uh, Dr. Frank Damasio. And I said, well, I know who Frank Damasio is because when I was 21, I started reading his books. Because they were passed to me, said you should read this book on revival that he wrote. The Making of a Leader, I think. Making of a Leader, which he wrote that while he was in college, by the way, in his 20s. That's so, you know, crazy. NBD. That's crazy. Crazy. So tell me today, like in 2024, yes. how much different does Legacy look like from when you started in 2016? There, there's, there's, a, there's a DNA component yeah. like we still really love Jesus obviously uh and so our worship you know we get after it 
you know, we, we, we're all in with our worship. And so there's still a component of that. I'm still preaching fiery, you know, lay your life down for the gospel. Let's go after Jesus together. Uh, but it's changed a lot. You know, uh, we have three services on a Sunday morning. And so we definitely use planning center and we yeah. have a flow and we have a set list and we're a lot more organized and we have systems and a staff and, you know, really focused on discipling people. It's more than just an event that people come to. It's a family that they yeah. belong to. So it's changed a lot. Lot, way more structure, way more structure. How was it for you guys? Like, that feels like that's a lot of like big adjustments. Getting married, two thousand thirteen. Yes. Planning the church in twenty sixteen. Yes. yes. Having children. Oh yeah. Um, how, how was all that for your wife and for you guys in your relationship? Oh man, well, um, my wife, bro, and you know she's in the room in the back. So, um, you know, I if she wasn't here, I'd. I'd probably cry, you know, but since she's here, I'll hold it together. But she's the best, man. Like from from start to finish, she's always been my greatest advocate, um, always been, you know, a champion of everything that I felt like God was speaking to us to do. And she is a real pastor, man. Like when we met, she was like, we're not going to work because you're a missionary and I'm a local church pastor. Mm. If you want to do missions, we're going to be planting churches and not in the third world. Europe, I can roll with, yeah. but like probably like home, Nashville, you know? And yeah. so like, she's really been, um, I mean, she's just been my strength every step of the way, man. <sighs> It's the greatest blessing, man. Greatest blessing, man. Greatest blessing to, that's why it's so important to pick the right person, man. I think especially like for those that are listening in ministry, I firmly believe, probably in all areas, but definitely I'm very, very clear about this in ministry, the person that you marry will either be your greatest asset or your greatest liability. I couldn't agree more. And when it comes to ministry, you don't have to all preach or be on the platform, but Mm -hmm. you better understand that it is a shared call. Like if you're... (laughs) You're dating somebody who's got that bug, that call on them. You better respect that thing, and you better understand that it's going to be your life too. Oh, yeah. And I think the great mistake that happens to so many people is one's got that call, and the other one's like, oh, I think it's cute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But calling ain't cute. It ain't cute, bro. But calling crushes. Yeah, and it's messy. It's messy, and like you're going to have to get around that thing and be a part of it, and it's a different life. And I just wouldn't be here today in any form or capacity of what I am today without my wife by my side, helping me. She is the greatest gift God has ever given me. Yes. And when it comes specifically to doing the work of a pastor, Mm -hmm. I'd have quit so long ago. Oh, yeah. How about this? They'd have fired me so long ago. (laughs) I'd have... She's just been... There's um, no doubt. It's like, uh, we always make that joke. It's like, I'm drawing lines and she's putting in the color, you know? Yes. She brings life to all of it. It's a huge blessing. Sounds like we have similar... Sounds like Spouses. We, grows, bro. we, we, we have Brothers, to be, man. man. We have to be. You sure you're not a Kentuckian, man? I somewhere? might be, man. You could be. I might be, bro. You could. You could, You got a little Owen Wilson vibe. I do? Yeah, a little bit. I love Owen Wilson. I do, too. He's hilarious. I think he's, like, really um, underrated. I do, too. Don't you think so? Yeah, I do. I feel like all the little cameos he makes. Remember Meet the Parents? He's the funniest one in Meet he's, the Parents. He's so funny. It's a Hulk bomb, or whatever he says about it. It was something Hulk. you just did that just reminded really? me of him. Yeah, I'm just fond of him. I like. I his feel movie. like he's real authentic and pleasant. Yeah, and like trustworthy. He's the same person in every movie. That is true, right? Is that Kevin Hart? Does that mean he's not a good actor? No, I think he's so <laughs> okay. loved that he can play anybody, and people will watch it. I heard I heard one of my friends was preaching the other day and he said the worst movie ever is Marley and Me. I think the whole point he was trying to make was that because it breaks your heart. Yeah, but I'm like, yeah. Marley and Me is a great film. Absolutely. Owen Wilson, if you haven't seen it. Absolutely. I yeah, we can him. recommend that one. I love Owen, man. Yeah, man. Um, tell me what's happening right now at Legacy. Sure. Like, tell yeah. me a little bit about like what God's doing. Yeah, man. We're just building. We are building. We are trying to figure out how to knit together a wine skin to hold the wine, so to speak, to give you an allegory. Like um, God's really been blessing us, you know, sent a lot of people to our church. People have moved from other cities to join our church in the last 18 months. And I'm not talking like one, two, three families. I'm talking like 10, 15 Mm -hmm. families have moved, watching online, decided to come. And so that's been really exciting, but we're just trying to figure out how to, you know, manage that growth. And I'm, bro, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to come here Mm. because I don't know how to do that super well. I don't know how to do church super well. And so I need to learn from you. And so that's the season that we're in, bro. It's like, we're trying to figure out how to deal with the good problem of growth. You know, I've been teaching a whole lot this year on life of Joshua. Mm. And recently uh, we just purchased one of my dad's churches, my dad's 
got cancer right now and he's going through oh, a whole I've thing. I've been praying for your Thank pops. You, I saw that on social media, man. I'm so sorry about Thank that. Thank you. It's been a whole journey, but we're in it and uh, God's with us. Yes. But I've, I've been, you know, I think whenever we're going through something, you find something in the Bible like, Look, who can I relate to? And yeah. uh, I know these Old Testament stories aren't about us. Yeah. Joshua's not me, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, Joshua, if anything, he's a, he's a type and shadow of Jesus. But yes. nonetheless, we can still draw from principles and lessons. And I'm just really inspired watching Joshua's life as he's in this huge transition. Mm. And he matures and he grows. Yes. That's why we're even having conversations like this one. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that really struck me the other day that I was teaching from, and I've never preached on it, I don't, I don't know a lot of messages around this subject, and it's what you're talking about. Mm. The Bible says that after the walls of Jericho came down, mm. he has this great victory. The Bible says that the fame of Joshua spread throughout the land. And I thought that was an interesting thought that, mm. you know, he gets a promise in yeah. Joshua chapter one. He has a problem in Joshua chapter three with the walls, mm -hmm. but now he's obeyed. What do you do when obedience to God leads to fame with man? Ooh. Because what you'll learn in life is that the devil can't defeat you with failure. He will certainly try to corrupt you with success. And where you guys are at right now is like, all right, we learned planning center. All right, yeah. uh, our church is not built on confidence monitors, right? but we understand its purpose. We've grown. And the real question becomes, all right, it's not that I'm going to fail because I can't actually get a wall to come down. Right. I might actually fail because all the walls I touch, they do come down. Yes. And it's the success and it's the growth that I actually don't know now that I'm here, mm -hmm. what the heck to do. Oh, yeah. And if we're really being honest, bro, like, and you and I both know from so many people that we watch fall from grace and all this stuff, and I'm not a critic or a judge by any means. Mm -hmm. I'm a lover of people. Yes. And I need grace. But Me it too. wasn't like they were failing. It wasn't they couldn't get walls to come down. No. It was usually because they didn't know how to manage that success. They That's didn't right. know how to manage growth. That's and you right. just said it like, That's right. How do, I, how do I handle the growth? Yeah, bro. Yeah. That's, well, a, different, that's a different level of conversation. That's a different a, form of maturity. It's like, all right, we're not talking about... Am I going to win the battle? Like, yeah, some, bro. I mean, there's going to be new battles, but I've Absolutely. won some battles in my day. That's like, right. That's right. I've had some victories. How do I keep standing here? How do I keep fighting? How do I? Yeah, man. How do I keep moving forward? How do you keep the edge? How do you stay hungry after you've won? After you're after you're thirty and zero, you know? How do you keep that hunger to win again? To fight again? To pick up the sword again? To take territory again? I mean, bro, you live here in Miami. This is a celebrity culture, I think. Yeah. Bro, I ain't really been to Miami much. I just expect it well, might hey. be. We just got you an apartment. Hey, hey pull on. <laughs> Get these guys an apartment. It doesn't work that way, but, you know. We're going to be down yeah, yeah. every yeah. six weeks, bro. Allison, we got you passes to, to, to Disney. The whole thing, okay? <laughs> Miami is the new. Miami is my new India, all right? Every 50 days, oh church, I'm out, all right? I'm coming down here. I'm going to be real tan. <laughs> bro. And uh, it's going to be amazing. We're going back to our roots. <laughs> We're going back to the beginning. I'm going back to the boats where God first called me. This is a missions church. All right, Pastor, we're with you. Where are we going? Miami. Miami. <laughs> Miami. Let's go. When I say three, you say oh five. Okay, it doesn't work that way, Rich. Okay, yeah, sorry. people people yeah. be like, uh, we're hold lost. on, wait we're just lost. a second, man. I, I, I mean, I, I would love it, bro, and I get it because, and I, I know you know more than me. I can only imagine what it was like, like, uh, and I hope I'm not bringing up anything like, old or sore or anything like when you did Kim and Kanye's mm. wedding you know what I mean I'm sure that that was crazy like people calling you texting you Rick can you believe this you're doing this like I remember when we first like blew up on YouTube right when we got our silver plaque yeah yeah right um pastors were calling me like how did you do it yeah uh, teach us teach us you blew up you're blowing up, and that phrase, you're blowing up, you're blowing up, you're blowing up, mm. started to grate on me, bro. It started bothering me. I was really, I was kind of tired of hearing that. And so one morning I got up at church and I said, hey, for those of you guys that have been saying to me that go to church here, and for my friends who've called or those of you guys who are watching us on YouTube talking about you guys are blowing up, I just want to make a quick statement. We don't care. Good. We don't care. What we want is to be desperate for Jesus. And I understand that success can actually hurt our desperation. Ooh. I think one of the biggest killers to our desperation, Rich, is a double portion. Heat. Yeah, man. I think a double portion can take you out because when people get twice as much as they need, Ooh. bro, 
They'll stop thirsting. They'll stop being hungry. They'll stop being desperate. And what's crazy about our culture is that they'll be stuck in a foothold, but they'll call it favor. God has blessed me so much that I don't have time for church anymore. God has blessed me so much that I don't have time for prayer anymore. God has blessed me so much that I don't have time for intimacy anymore. Dude, when did the favor of God start leading us away from fellowship with God? You're preaching. You know what I'm saying? Like if the intimacy doesn't increase with the favor, then you actually call in favor What's a foothold? Ooh. And we got people out here today talking about it's a blessing, it's a blessing, it's it's a distraction. You're preaching. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So we gotta stay, we gotta stay, gotta keep that dog energy, man. But what but what's interesting what you're saying, it's like number one, if you're too busy for God, homie, you're too busy. You're too busy. You know, like you're, just, you're too busy. I read a quote the other day, um, hurry's not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. Mm. And there's this idea when you're hearing, I'm blo- you're blowing up, which is all, by the way, so silly and oh. stupid and small. And if we're not careful, we'll just live in our little cul de sac oh, and little community dude. of, ah, you're, bl-. it's like, come on, man. Like even that passage of Joshua becoming famous, it's, it's a lie because fame is fleeting. Fame is this, it's a cheap currency that our world lives by right now, yes, which sir. is dependent upon external factors totally. to try to produce a fabricated security, which we know all security comes from the inside out, yes. comes from our identity in Christ. But I think what's what's scary about this whole thing about success is that we get so, we love hearing it. Mm-hmm. And I really believe that fame, if you'll, what it does is it creates distance between you and real people. And I think what you have Sheesh. to do is that you actually have to put yourself back into positions and put yourself through habit and discipline into places where you're saying, no, I'm going to make sure I'll put myself back in the mess, back into the uncomfortable thing. Amen. It's like the running. We can get back to the marathon. We're coming full circle. It's like, yeah, you got to, you got to stay in it. You got to stay in the training of it. You're not just done. You have to make it a lifestyle and a habit. And what's cool about that whole story with Joshua is that if you just stop the story there, like I could see someone preaching, like, let me teach you how to be famous for God, you know? Right, like, right. And I don't know why I did that voice, but um, <laughs> but what's cool is reading the whole book. It's like you get to Joshua yeah. 9, and what you find out is that Joshua actually wasn't obsessed with his fame. Mm. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 9 that they came, the Gibeonites, and they said, we've heard of the fame of your God. Mm. And it just That's already good. shows me that he's like, from Joshua 6 to Joshua 9, read the whole story. Mm. Yeah, I might do some stuff out of my obedience to God. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. That might make me famous or totally. blow up for a moment totally. or momentum. Absolutely. But yo, as quick as they deify you, you'll be as quick as they crucify you. A hundred percent, And you bro. better understand that that same thirst that you need for their celebration mm-hmm. will kill you when they reject you. That's good. And it's two sides of the same coin and you have to actually build some resiliency that I'm not doing it, brah, mm. for you. No way. I'm doing it unto the Lord and the only reason why these walls came down was not because of my YouTube strategy, not because of some celebrity I knew, Mm-mm. not because of my fit, not because of my style, not because of the way I talk. It was because of the Lord. It's because of God. Like Only reason. Because of God. Only reason. And I think we just get, I think we grow weary in doing good and we start liking what people are saying to Absolutely. us. And we Buying into our own press. Can I, can I make a statement? Yeah, you can say anything. Um, bro, I want to be famous in hell. There you go. There you go. I want to be famous in hell, bro. Talk I don't about care it. about being famous in the earth. Like if if, if we if we get influence, wonderful. If we don't have influence, who cares, right? Like, bro, I say this all the time. Like, young people today are so consumed with popularity. I watched our parents' generation wrestle with this idea of the prosperity gospel. And we now know it's a doctrine of demons, mm. right? They get caught up thinking that your your net worth is your self-worth, and they think that, okay, if I'm really rich, then I have a whole lot of value. Mm. Today, we don't struggle with the prosperity gospel. We struggle with the popularity gospel. Ooh. We're, we're thinking that my follower count equates my favor. And it's not true, man. Some of the most powerful, anointed, amazing preachers I've ever met that have raised the dead don't even have a cell phone. That's the truth. That's the truth, bro. That's the real truth. And we buy into our own press, you know, because we have, you know, a thousand people show up to an event. Bro, I've met people from Ethiopia that have a million people in their church. Yep. Yep. You know, and it's like... Was well, that beautiful Mother Teresa quote? I think it's like, God hasn't called me to be successful. He's called me to be faithful. Amen. 
I like that. I want to be famous in hell. I want to be famous in hell. Back. I want the prison guards in hell to know me on a first name basis. You better man. preach. You know what I'm saying? I like your preaching, man. That's Jesus it. arrested me at 21. I thought hey. the SWAT team was out there. Hey, but I got apprehended. It was the King of Kings. The, it's that the holy, hound it's, of heaven. He was outside. That's my door. it, man. It's that holy. It's it's that holiness, man. <laughs> it's the roots, man. I used to go to brush arbors as a kid. You know what a brush arbor is? <laughs> Tell me about it. A brush arbor is an open air revival meeting, but not a tent you set up temporarily. It's actually a structure that my papa built in Sacramento, Kentucky as an annual meeting place where we would go and, and worship the Lord until past midnight. And I used to remember watching my dad preach until he would wring sweat out of his tie and I would watch my aunties roll around in the sawdust because that's what they would put on the floor, you know, with their big beehive hairdos and they'd have sawdust in them. And so even though it's like, you know, some of those traditions were a little wonky. You know, the power of God was present, and it marked me. And so today, you know, I, I remember those moments. I, I remember times in church whenever I pretended like I didn't get the glory goosebumps, but I knew God was in the room. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons, Rich, I would say that I don't really care so much about all of the external accolades is because I just often remember sleeping in the back of a 1987 box Chevy. So nothing like the presence of God, nothing like the presence of God, man, nothing like being touched by God. Nothing like it, it is funny. Ain't no high like the most high mm -hmm. man. Preach. Um, you're talking about I want to be famous in hell. I think this is so good. I, I was thinking, uh, when I was like 20, yeah, probably 23, 24, used to preach this old message. I think I got it from Jim Raley. You ever heard Jim Raley? Oh, preach? yeah. Bro, That's he's a, a dog. He's a, he got some dog in him, doesn't he? Bro, he, he Apostle Raley, bro. I'm a, that man. He throws down. Can just preach. Some people just got that flow. But I used to, I think it was an old message I had ripped from him, but it was, hell's got what you need, or four things in hell that you, I can't remember how I did it, but like, it's that old story where like, um, it's that parable that Jesus taught about the, the the man in hell calling out, is it Lazarus or whatnot? Oh, yeah, yeah, So it's yeah. like there's a prayer language in hell. There's a thirst in hell. Uh, there's, a, there's an evangelistic spirit. Please go tell my brothers. Please Stop. let them know. I don't want them to come here. And it's like hell's got. There's some things in hell that you actually need, bro. You need to learn how to pray. They're hey. praying in hell, but ain't nobody answering. They're thirsty in hell, but ain't nobody coming to. But we got the living water. I just. If y'all don't know, this is what preachers do yeah, whenever they get do, together. Bro. Like, we're literally over time, I think. But, like, this is what we do. <laughs> we sit we down do. at the table. We wear our alpha flies. And we just that exchange sermons. That I can't even run in. You can, bro. This is what just, gave me a stress you, fracture. You man. need to be healed I'm in injured, Jesus' bro. name. I got a bad, is it called a gate? A bad gate. Okay, well, we can work on that. I, I can look, help you. I look like I'm, I'm not even 40 yet. When I run, I look like I'm 49 no. Yeah, man. No. Yeah, no, man. No, I saw no, the photos no, of the marathon. No. I was like, oh, God, bro. Like, how about this? You know, like, I'm out there. I, I, it's hot here, bro. I, I can't run with my shirt on. Yeah, bro, yeah, yeah. I don't have a good body. Okay. Same. Someone's like, hey, in the comments, like, after the marathon, I'm, I'm just like, I'm completely humiliated. I'm, this is the most humbling thing I've ever done in my life. Yes. Posting a five hour time. Nothing about this is cool. This is not like a. You fit This is not a brag. This is like, bro, I'm just like, this is a big deal. Someone's like, hey, just serious question. Can we just talk about modesty for a moment? I'm like, yo, there are some lines. When you look as bad as I do and I'm doing it this bad, yes, this is modest, bro. That's this right. Is, uh, there's no arrogance in this post. No. Look at me, bro. That's like, right. Are you for real? You ever been in a labor war? I'm 23 pounds overweight. Ain't no modesty I got a hunchback out here, man. My trying knees. to give birth to promises. Dear God in heaven, man. Yeah, I, I know. I get those people, as well. Bro. You can't like, please them. If you post an ice bath, I promise you they're going to come for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm getting you that ice bath tonight. Oh, let's go. Yeah. You want to do it? Um, we're going to my house. Get Easy. You the, get you in the plunge. Easy. Get you in the sauna. Easy. Gonna, um, I got no problems with that. Yeah. Going to get you in the uh, Nordatech boots. Oh, I got some of those. Yeah, me too. Oh, they're fire, right? That's a lifestyle. Bro. It is. It's a big it part is. of my prayer life. Really? Yeah. You do it every morning? Quite a bit, man. Three hours in prayer, two hours in the north. <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep it this man going. has three kids. Man, hey, <laughs> I love you, man. I love, I love you as well. Thank will, you. Will for you please me. come back and, and be on? I think you should just. I think we should do this weekly together. Parentally, yes, I love this. Yeah, bro, I will. I will. I'll fly down, man. You, you know, since I got an apartment here now and everything. Yeah, bro, we got bro, your I'll, spot. I'll, bro, I'll come beach, down on the beach. man. I'll be your co-host. Oh, the missions base. The missions base. Sending I'll lay hands on my it's wife, anoint with oil. It's a sending ministry. Absolutely. We Thank love you guys, bro. man, and love we you. admire all that you guys are doing. We're behind you. We celebrate you. Keep going. Everything that's in your heart.
Do Thank all that's you. in your heart. That's what I hear from the Lord saying. Do all that's in your heart. You haven't seen anything yet. And um, this is going to be, I think, a breakout year for you guys. We're Amen. behind you. So happy you're in Miami. Amen. And we love your family. It's my friend, man, Lyle Phillips. If you haven't followed him somewhere, go check him out. Hey, do us a favor. If you enjoyed today, let us know in the comments. And go ahead, like it, subscribe it, share it. I think that's pretty good stuff, man. We're starting to get the hang of this. This is Mature Me. We'll see you next time.